Well, greetings, everyone, and welcome to God's Unchanging Word in this week's edition for our news, nuggets, and insights. Today is Friday, August 11th, 2017, rushing to the Feast of Tabernacles. Actually, we're under two months. I want to welcome our audience. We're glad everyone could stay. We're actually taping on a Sabbath day. After services, we had a guest in town, which we're going to introduce, and he'll be with us for the second half of this program. So today, we're going to divert from our normal format where we go into the news, pretty depressing news. You probably had a fill of it this week anyway. We're going to get right into talking about God's Holy Days, and I'm calling it God's Holy Days 101. What we wanted to do is introduce God's Fall Holy Days and give you the foundation and the basis of the Holy Days and the plan of God, especially for the people who are new to God's truths and who are learning these ways that they've never understood before. We're also going to get into talking about a, a story that we brought you a few weeks ago about a need in Kenya and some good news I want to share with you. I just received this morning an email talking about uh, a request that we had made to all the brethren. And then we're going to have a special guest with us today, Mr. Bobby Edmonds, who's in town, who actually delivered the sermon message. And he'll be with joining us for the second half of our program. So let's get right into the program. God's Holy Days, His plan of salvation, and we're going to be talking about the Feast of Trumpets. So let's give you a quick background and a review of two slides that we brought last week. So if you missed the program, we were talking about God's Holy Days are revealed in His harvest. The spring Holy Days come, have come to pass and fulfilled the first coming of Jesus Christ. So if you're familiar with God's holy word, you know from Jesus Christ, he said in his own words that everything that was prophesied of him had to come to pass and he had to fulfill even the least bit of the prophecies. Even to the point at the very end with his face beaten and bloodied where he was unrecognizable and he asked for a drink of water and they put vinegar in his mouth and when they did, can you imagine your mouth all cut up and put vinegar in your mouth? And he said, it is finished. And the scriptures go on to tell us that several of those things that he did just before he died was to fulfill the, the prophecies of his coming. So we know from the spring harvest that Jesus Christ fulfilled to the letter every prophecy concerning his first coming. The fall holy days talk about the things that must come to pass that hasn't taken place yet, which is the fulfillment of his second coming. So we know that if it was going to be fulfilled to every point in the first coming, all the prophets concerning him personally must be fulfilled also to the, to the, the minutest little detail. Now, the Bible tells you that all prophecies says some will fail, but those concerning Christ will not fail. They will be fulfilled in Jesus Christ. The spring holy days, we find those in Passover and leavened bread. So if you needed to look for the institution that God gave us to follow the Passover and the days of unleavened bread, you'll find them in Leviticus 23, verse 4 through 8. The fall holy days are in trumpets, atonement, and tabernacles. You find Leviticus 23 through 44. In the middle, it's called the Feast of Weeks. The Feast of Weeks is, is like, a, 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 a encapsulates all of the 7,000-year plan, even unto what they say the 50th day or the, the uh, seven times seven weeks plus one day, which is talking about the Feast of Tabacco's last great day in all of the harvest period during that specific time, talking about the harvest of mankind. So we'll get into that at another time. We want to stay now with the very first of the fall holy days, which is trumpets. It's found in Leviticus 23, verse 23 and 24. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel, saying that in the seventh month, on the first day of the month, you shall have a Sabbath rest, a memorial of blowing of trumpets, a holy convocation, and you shall do no customary work on it, and you shall offer an offering made by fire to the Lord. So what I've done here is I've kind of highlighted just a few of the points that God brings out in these three verses. And here's the interesting thing about this. When you look at the instructions that God gives on the holy days in Leviticus 23, 
the trumpets, the Feast of Trumpets, is the least amount of information. But when you look at the Bible, nearly a third of that Bible is dealing with prophecy in the return of Jesus Christ. So what God has encapsulated in nearly a third of the Bible, he has put together right here in three verses. So that's absolutely fascinating how God can do that. So we're going to talk about that. We're going to just, but today we're just going to do the intro. The Jewish community observes a holiday called Rosh Hashanah. So if you tell people in the world today, if you've been in a church and say, I keep the Feast of Trumpets, most of them have never heard the Feast of Trumpets. But if you tell them Rosh Hashanah, then they'll know, well, then you must be Jewish. They get at least a little bit of an idea of what it is, meaning the head of the year. Now, the head of the year is quite interesting because you see this is taking place in the seventh month, not the first month, but yet it's giving us a meaning that says the head of the year. All right, so we'll talk about that. It's a biblical festival known in the scripture as Yom Turim, or the Day of Trumpets, or as we just read in Leviticus 23, the blowing of trumpets, because the Israelites were to blow trumpets on that day. They would have to blow a shofar, and in Israel, they would blow different types of trumpets for different events. The shofar would sound a sound of warning or a sound of war, thus picturing the time of the return of Jesus Christ, the day of trumpets, a time of war, and the blowing of trumpets is to let this world know that he's coming back and he's going to do battle to take over this world. All right, and you'll see in, in, at another time, we'll talk about how that battle takes place. Of all the days given in Leviticus, the information in trumpets, as I just said, is the shortest. But more is written in the Bible on the fulfillment of trumpets than on any other subject. Nearly a third of the Bible refers to the prophecies concerning the return of Jesus Christ. And I brought that out again because I want to reiterate how God drives us so much meaning in so little words. How about this one? Thou shall have no other God before me. Not a lot of words. The impact of that statement can, can move an entire nation into captivity or freedom. Thou shall have no other God before me. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Few words that are written in those specific passages, and God just piles on information behind them. Matthew 24 says this. So now let's pull in a few verses, all right? Let's pull in a few verses about the day of trumpets and what the Bible says. Matthew 24, verses 29 through 31. Then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven, and then all the tribes on the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory, and he will send his angels with the great sound of a trumpet. So this is a day that everything evolves around the blowing of trumpets. And that's what God was telling them in Leviticus 23. And it says that you should have a sound of the blowing of trumpets. So now God gives us revealing through his word, scriptures talking about the blowing of those trumpets and how they apply to the return of Jesus Christ. So let me pick up again. And he will send his angels with the great sound of a trumpet, and they will gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. So, I mean, the story behind these verses is that God just continues to unveil those mysteries of where, where the man is. Now, I don't know if you just realized what I just read to you. What I just read to you debunks heaven and earth in hell. So he's going to gather his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. All right, they're not all in heaven, they're not all in hell. So he's going to go gather them for the four winds, and the other scriptures say from the four corners of the earth. 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians 15 is the resurrection chapter, verse 51 and 52. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we all shall be changed in the moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. 
All right, so now if we were in a Bible study talking about this and we wanted to dissect the scripture a little bit, we just reinforced what we just read in Matthew. But this adds something else. It says that the dead will be raised incorruptible. So if they're in heaven, who is he raising from the dead? So you see, when people read these scriptures with a preconceived thought of what parents gave you as you grew up and what this world teaches, you realize what you have been given, you have been supplanted with. It's amazing, Jacob is called the supplanter. Well, Satan does the exact same thing. He supplants his theology to give you a false religion. So when you read this, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, I've been at funerals where I've done funerals, and there's been one person said that that person's in heaven, and I'll come right behind them and read this verse and say they're going to be resurrected when Christ comes from the dead out the grave, and I'll hear in that audience going, Amen, brother, and not realizing what they have just read just contradicted what they just believed. It's absolutely amazing. All right, but when does it take place? At the trump. The day of trumpets represents the day of the return of Jesus Christ. Going on, let me give you another verse. 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 and 17. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, and with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God. So all of these trumps that the children of Israel were to proclaim on that specific day was to resemble what God himself was doing from heaven with the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will raise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Oh, there you go. Now people think you're going to heaven. That's what it says, right? We're going to catch up with Christ in the air. And if you went on, it says, and there will be ever with him again. So let's take this and let's dissect that a little bit. The dead in Christ will raise first. I underlined it. Then we who are alive shall be caught up together with them. So here's, let's, let's put this in perspective. All of those who have died in Christ, in Christ, when Jesus Christ returns, that trumpet sounds going to be like an alarm clock going off. And people are going to be coming out of the graves in a spirit form, which we just read, incorruptible, then if we're alive at the time of the return of Jesus Christ, we will change from this physical mortal body to a spiritual body to meet Christ in the air. So here you got Christ coming down from the throne and we're going up and we're going to meet him in the clouds. Is, so what happens after that? Let's go on. Revelation 20 verse 4 says this, then I saw souls of those who that had been beheaded for the witness to Jesus for the word of God, who had not worshipped the beast or his image, and had not received the mark in their foreheads or in their hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. Where are they living and reigning with Christ for a thousand years? Revelation 5 verse 10, it says they reign on this earth for a thousand years, not in heaven. So, so obviously, when we raise up, we meet Christ in the clouds, we're meeting him on his way back down to this earth. And we'd be with him for a thousand years, it says, on this earth. Blessed and holy is he who has part in the first resurrection. Now, have you ever heard that before? Right, if you're listening to this program for the first time and you're new to God's truth, this is something you need to pay attention to. The first resurrection all right, we're going to be with Christ, a first resurrection. If there's a first resurrection, there's also a, a second resurrection. Revelation 20, verse 5 says this, but the rest of the dead live not again to the thousand, do not again. All right, and I should have had a little bit further. All right, there it is, until the thousand years were finished. All right, so the rest of the dead live not again to the thousand years were finished. So what are we looking at? We're looking at a plan of God that is going to call people in this lifetime to be revealed the truth about the resurrection and the return of Jesus Christ. Those people will be a part of Jesus Christ's ministry for a thousand years on this earth 
for a thousand years on this earth who are going to rule and reign and going to put this planet back to the condition it once was in when, when Adam and Eve was created from the beginning back to perfection. When that thousand years is finished, there's going to be a second resurrection, it says. And in, at that time, the rest of the world who's never had the opportunity to know the truth of what I'm sharing with you today will be given that opportunity to learn the truth of God. So now, let's go back to where we were. And we're going to meet him in the clouds in the air. Is that, I don't want to leave us hanging there. So then what happens? Look what it says in Zechariah chapter 14, 3 and 4. Then the Lord will go forth and fight against those new nations as he fought in the day of battle. And in that day, his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, which faces Jerusalem on the east. So here's the story. When Jesus Christ comes on that day, God will give the word and there'll be a sound of the trump. All of those who are dead in Christ will be resurrected. Those who are alive in Christ will be transformed to spirit beings. All of them will rise up in the air to meet with Christ coming back down to this earth. On that day, it says, his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives. And there you and I will join Jesus Christ and we will rule and reign on this earth with him for a thousand years. It all begins on the day of trumpets. That's what this day pictures, but there's a lot more to it. So let me give you just a little bit more about it. So let's go back to the verse. I'm just pulling it all up that we just read before. So now what do we have? When does it take place? In the seventh month, on the first day of the month. It's called the head, the head of months. Why is that? On the seventh month, the first day of the month, being the head. Well, seven is the, is the number of completion to God. It's the number of perfection, completion. What's interesting was, when Jesus was on this earth, he said, my kingdom is not of this world. His rulership didn't start to win to the sound of the trump. And he begins to rule and reign and on that seventh day, beginning the millennial reign, the seventh thousand year plan of God. It begins a thousand years rest. They call it a Sabbath rest, the seventh day. His kingdom begins to rule on the first day of the seventh month in the seventh thousand year plan of God for mankind. Incredible, the tapestry all tied in together. So we have the seventh month, first day of the month, we have to have a Sabbath rest. The, seven, the millennial reign is pictured as a Sabbath rest. Hebrews tells us it's a Sabbath rest, a memorial blowing of trumpets, a holy convocation, no work, and you shall offer an offering made by fire to the Lord. So here's all the points that we're going to go into in the future. Starting next week, we want to cover the seventh month, the first day of the month, the, the Sabbath rest, and how that ties into the thousand-year rest. Blowing of trumpets, the holy convocation, and you shall offer an offering. So now, let me leave you with one thing before we move on to the second half of the program. A memorial. So what's a memorial? So as I was preparing this for you today, I said, I come across something, I said, this is an interesting question. The definition, according to Webster, is uh, serving to preserve remembrance of something such as a monument or a, or, or a ceremony that honors a person who has died. We know what a memorial is. You'll see, you know, memorials, they'll hold them, a person dies, we have a memorial service to that individual, or they'll go to a graveside, they hold a memorial service. Uh, it goes on to say this, or it serves as a reminder of an event of which many people died such as we have in America today, we call it Memorial Day. We, we, memor we have a day set aside, you know, to pay respect to those who have fallen in our nation. All right, so this is not, this is not something that's new to anybody. But, but think about this now. The instruction was given in Leviticus 23 to hold a memorial, a blowing of trumpets. A memorial is about someone who died. Christ hasn't come yet. So you were instructed to hold a memorial to the dead who hadn't been here yet. Interesting. And so I started looking at this. I said, wow, this is pretty interesting. So thousand years before Christ comes, the children of Israel are memorializing his death before he came. 
So we're going to talk about that next time. So there's the question. Leviticus 23 was written long before Christ was crucified. But yet a memorial pictures the past tense of someone who had died. Interesting what God has hidden there. We'll pick up next week on our trumpets talking about the memorial and what was going on at that time that God gave it to the children of Israel. And then we're going to go back and we're going to dissect those three verses and put in some of the meaning that you probably never ever heard before, especially if you're new to the truth of God. All righty, before we move on, let's take a break. We've got a little video. We had this video last week, and it was uh, received with a lot of positive feedback. So we're going to take and watch this little video. And when we come back, we're going to have our guest in town, Bobby Edmonds, going to be sitting right here at our desk. Watch this video, and we'll be right back. Fear is the dark room where negatives are developed. Did you know the Bible says that Jesus is the photograph of God? When Paul writes that Jesus is the image of God, that word is icon, which means photograph. No wonder the sky went dark when Jesus was crucified, because it was there in the dark room of Golgotha that Jesus developed the picture of a God who loves us to death. Face your fears with the God who made the universe. Because when you don't walk with God, negatives develop in the dark room of fear. But when you do walk with God, life is like photography. We develop from the negatives. Welcome back to God's Unchanging Word. And we're back with Bobby Edmonds from Mobile, Alabama. Bobby, welcome, and we're glad you can join us. Nice to be here, Tom. Right. We met Bobby just a, a little over a year ago, I guess it was now. And Bobby's been back in New Orleans several times. He delivered the sermon message today. And Bob, we're going to spend the rest of our program with Bobby. But before we do that, I want to bring you an update on Kenya. So let's go to this. God's people are, are so incredible. Uh, when, when you let them know that there's an, a genuine need, they always come to bat to help God's people. We mentioned just a few weeks ago on Friday, July 21st, on News Nuggets and Insights, that Kenya was looking for donations to help them to get a car. Uh, according to the government, uh, in case you didn't see that program, according to the government, since they have an orphanage, is that they needed to have a way, if one of the children got injured or sick or something happened, that they had a way to get them into town to be able to take care of those needs. So basically they passed a law that they needed to have a vehicle to do that. Well, they didn't have the funds. So we made a mention about that, and uh, that was just on July 21st, and here we are just the uh, second week in August, and I got an email from them today on a report that they actually received enough funds that they actually bought a vehicle. It's, uh, they call it the Sangria Orphanage's uh, motor vehicle. They bought it for $4,000, and they wanted to thank everyone who did, donated so very, very much. So I got his email this morning, and I want to share that with you to thank all of you for stepping up to the plate to help them. We did this a couple years ago when he was helping a, a, a town that had, didn't have a single freshwater uh, well and sewage area that they, they needed in that whole town, and it was disgusting, and y'all raised enough funds to be able to do that. And they work hard to, do, to, to take care of these people. So let me share you a, a couple of things here. It says, thanks to the donations that have already come in, we were able to purchase a very nice used Nissan pictured below, which I just showed you in the picture, for a cost of $4,000. So now what they're doing is they've poured them a, a cement slab, which they do themselves, and they said as soon as they get a little more funds, they're going to purchase some steel pipe and some wood and the sheet metal to be able to store it in because they said the heat in the sun over there is just unbearable. So anyway, we just pray for them to continue to do what they're doing. But I want to share this one little paragraph with you, what he's doing. When, when Bill and I spoke uh, several years ago, when we first met, and he was here in New Orleans talking about his work, Kenya Hands of Hope, 
He talked about all the things that they were doing, and we talked about becoming self-sufficient in helping the people over there. So look what he's, he's writing now. As many of you know, we've been teaching boys numerous trades of carpentry, masonry, painting, and more. They've had plenty of hands-on experience, and as for the girls, our hope is to purchase for them a Singer sewing machine, and so we have someone here at the camp who is quite capable of teaching them how to use it. Our goal is to prepare all of these orphans to be self-supportive. So he's not only built an orphanage, he's teaching them how to be able to be self-sufficient. They're raising their own food. They got their own animals that they're, they're multiplying with their own animals. And it's well on the way to becoming a self-sufficient uh, program in school. In fact, they even pay to send their kids to school over there. So I wanted to share that with you and, and update you. And thanks to all of y'all and helping the Kenya Hands of Hope. It's, this was a remarkable in just less than three weeks to be able to come up with enough money to help them get a vehicle. All right, so that's that. All right, let's move on now. Bobby Edmonds is in town from Mobile, Alabama. Uh, they have a great con congregation over in Mobile. So if you're going to go to Mobile to find your church, what do you want them to do first? Just give me a call at 709-4627. That's area code 251. Just give Bobby a call to find out uh, where services are located and what time of services? 10 a.m. 10 a.m. Now, when I was over there with you, y'all had a potluck. Do y'all do that every week? Every week. Oh, you have potluck every week? Yes, sir. So you can't miss out which weekend you go if you want to be fed. Is my wife calls the Church of God. We're the well-fed Church of God. And they had a great potluck over there. They had a great potluck and great services. Well, Bobby, um, I've, got, I've got a little bit of information here. This, if you're in the area, we was able to at least pull this much up, is that this is the, uh, the, the church area where they meet at. So if you're driving in the area, it's, it's a sort of a rural area a little bit. And they, got, they meet at the Joyful Living um, Study Ministry. Is, is, is where y'all, you've been there for a while now. Yes, sir. You've been there for a while. To give you an idea of what you're looking at and where you're at, if you look it up in Google, like we were doing before we actually started taping the program today, is that we have the address as 08 South Ann Street. Google, for some reason, brings us to 60 North Ann Street. But it's in the same area within a block or two, so if you're over there, you shouldn't have any trouble finding this. Bobby, you, interest, you, you brought an interesting story today about your past, growing up in the church. So I, wanna, I want you to tell our audience about that. But first, before you do that, tell us a little bit about, about your congregation, how long you've been meeting with them, about how many people you might have. Just kind of introduce the audience a little bit to uh, what you'll have over there. Well, Tom, I've been uh, over there for a little over three years now. And uh, it's not a large congregation, but uh, it's a very caring group of people. Uh, not, I've, I've not come in contact with, with very many people that are so personable. Uh, every Sabbath is, is a joy uh, for us. And uh, with all the different personalities, you know, you just kind of look forward to coming to Sabbath services and uh, enjoying the peace and uh, knowing that we're doing what God has instructing us to do, which is clearing to my conscience. And uh, it's just a part of my life, and I, I just love it. And I hate to see anybody miss out on such wonderful opportunities as God's people getting together on the Sabbath. I, I was invited, I guess it was about maybe a year ago I was over there. Audrey and I and Jeff and George Ann, we all went over there. And what I noticed, first of all, you were leading songs that day. And you were so relaxed and so natural. You were having a good time up there. And I said, wow, this guy is incredible. I'm not trying to build your head up. I said, this guy really knows his music. And he's leading songs and it was powerful. And uh, I, I, just, I just wanted to mention that to you. Because I hope in the future maybe that you can come over, spend the weekend, and maybe we can do some, uh, some instructions on video with you and Clayton Evans here, one of our ministers who's our song leader in New Orleans, so that maybe we can help those around the country to lead songs uh, because a song leader adds dynamics to the service to get everybody off on a, you know, a rousing start and get them involved and being a part of it. 
So I want to I wanted you to think about that. So maybe one time during the year we can just get you over here and you can come over. You spend a couple hours and make a make a, a song leading CD that we can just mail out to all the brethren so that they can use them in their own areas to give them. Because I tell you what, I can do sermons, but I get up there to lead songs, and I'm a dud. <laughs> I'm an absolute dud. So anyway, I just wanted to mention that to you. Then we invited you over here, and you're a very enthusiastic speaker. A lot of dynamics, a lot of uh, enthusiasm, a lot of excitement in your delivery. Now, what I didn't realize until today is the hardships that you have incurred in the church of God growing up over the years. So if you wouldn't mind, tell them a little bit about your past coming into the church and being an eight-year-old and what you had to encounter in the church of God. It is, it's still a, a very interesting thing to me even today, Tom, uh, going back in my mind and... Uh, we did start attending uh, what was then Worldwide Church of God in Oklahoma City. Uh, we met downtown. Uh, I was eight years old, and uh, my dad had just gotten out of the Army, and uh, he was a man of order. And uh, we weren't allowed to uh, move during services. Once you went in and you sat down, you were there until uh, after the amen, so to speak. <laughs> and, uh, of course, being a young child like that, you don't know what was going on, we had to uh, turn to the scriptures, take notes, and uh, it was all not very clear to me until I got much older. Uh, we were beat up as children, me and my brother, for going to church uh, on the Sabbath downtown with uh, other people who weren't like us, and uh, it was a, a very difficult time. Now that I have come to the understanding that God is dealing with man, and has plans for man, and nothing can alter what God is doing. If we are interested and we are communicating with him, he is going to take care of us and see his plan through. So uh, it's a very exciting life. I am excited about what is in that book. Uh, I love the brethren. I love the praise of God, Tom. Well, that's, that's an incredible story. We, we, we talk about persecution at the end time, not realizing that, that a young child being persecuted and actually being beat up. And as you mentioned in the sermon today, you got your knocks on a few of them back <laughs> as a child, which is understandable, is that, that all those years, you, you, you're more fervent in the truth than ever. So that was a remarkable story. So, so many of the children, it's, it's hard to keep our children in church. You know, we struggle to find out why and what's going on, why we lose so many of them. But maybe we could sit down and talk about what's the difference that maybe your parents might have done with you all. Because your whole family is still in the church pretty much. Because I know last year at the Feast of Tabernacles, I got to deep meet most of them in, in uh, Fort Walton. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was a, a warm family. They're, they're excited. We were glad to see everybody there. And so maybe you all tapped into something. Maybe, maybe the children need to struggle a little bit more and is they, as they grow up to appreciate the values of the truth that the parents have been given to them. So, so anything else you want to bring up uh, while you're here to talk about the congregation and what, what's going on over there? Uh, no, sir. I'll just uh, say that, that we are there uh, every week, count seven days from today, and we'll be there. And uh, everybody is, is welcome. Uh, we are not perfect by any means, and uh, we all know that. And we are just pulling together and uh, just seeking to do what is pleasing to the Creator. Uh, you, have, you have one more thing, though. You have uh, a, a new person, a new minister, meeting with you all now who was, wasn't there when I came a year ago. Right. So, so tell us about him. Uh, the, Mr. Bernie Monsalvo has uh, began uh, attending with us. Uh, Bernie is a very detailed speaker. Uh, he's, a, he's a fantastic personality. In my opinion, uh, I've gained a good bit of understanding for, from Bernie, rather. Uh, he, he's very encouraging, and uh, he's, he's just something that is, I believe, that, that God caused him to come there with us because he just adds a lot of understanding. Things that I have read and studied about for years, he has enhanced my understanding in that area. So. Uh, 
Bernie Monsalvo is, is most welcome in our congregation. Well, that's great. So if you're ever in Mobile, please, by all means, or if you're in a general area, if you're going on vacation, you're passing through, look them up. Go by and visit. They have uh, live sermons pretty much every week. Uh, they have uh, potluck every week. They have their own location. They've been there for a number of years. You won't be disappointed, so if you're down that way, stop by and give them a visit. All right, so now let's bring the program now to a close. Let me update you from the website, uh, from uh, what we got going on in the church. Last week, we mailed out the quarterly, so if you're on the mailing list, you should have your quarterly. That's the cover. It's talking about the sermon, America's Trojan Horse. It's an amazing story, very sobering, uh, very intense sermon delivered last week. We'll be going out in the cord, and um, th at the end of this month, we'll be sending this sermon out. So if you're not on the mailing list, by all means, get on the mailing list or go online and just write for America's Trojan Horse, talking about the evil within, and you're going to get one of the most uh, down-to-earth, realistic, sobering sermons for the time that we live in today that you've probably heard in a long time. From the website, we found that we had, last week we announced we had 455 videos online. Jeff told me he's added 20 new videos this week. So now there's 475 videos online that you can go to. Let me back it up to the COGMI YouTube channel. I mean, we're just under 500 video sermons now online. Uh, by the way, yours will go online that you delivered today. We'll be putting that online. So if you want to hear Bobby's sermons, you can go online, go to the, the uh, COGMI YouTube channel, and you'll be able to get his sermon that he delivered right here today in front of the audience. Very dynamic sermon. Also, going out this coming week, we'll be mailing out a sermon by Clayton Evans, our minister here in the audience, on He Will Rule with a Rod of Iron. And the sermon that, uh, or actually it was a News Nuggets and Insights from July 4th, that's uh, almost one hour long. It was one of the most uplifting, more powerful messages we've spent in News Nuggets and Insights that you can actually use for services if you would like to do that, with quite a number of videos that we put into that, into that message. July 4th, News, Nuggets, and Insights. Those two messages are going in the mail this week. If you're on the mailing list, by all means, write for these sermons. All right, Feast of Tabernacles. Again, there's our feast sites this year for Walton Beach, Florida, Myrtle Beach, Lancaster, Auburn, Indiana, Branson, Missouri, Kenya, and Trinidad for the two international sites. We've also added, as I mentioned last week, Baltimore, Maryland, which is an associate congregation who just, who just began associating with us this past year. And so I will actually be flying into Baltimore, driving to Lancaster on the feast, drive back to Baltimore, spend the day with the Baltimore congregation, give a sermon there, and then fly on out to Missouri. So I'll get to spend uh, a day with the Baltimore brethren and meet all of those people up there. So if you're in any of these areas going for the Feast of Tabernacles, by all means, our congregations, are, they're small feast sites with the congregations, but they're very warm and they're very friendly, and you won't be disappointed. As we try to do each week, we're going to close our program out with another inspirational message. This one I thought was very interesting because the first one's talk, talking about making something positive out of a negative. This video by the same person is talking black keys make music too. Talking about the black keys are more of a sober note and even in the sober notes that you can make music out of the environment of even the sober note. So if we're ready, let's play that video and then we'll be right back. Perhaps you feel like a gasoline engine running on diesel, or like you're not moving through time, but time is moving through you, or like life is a song and you forgot the tune. During worship services, we sing songs to God, but did you know God sings back to us? In the Bible, Zephaniah says, that God gets so happy when he thinks about you that he busts out in song. Ariana Grande ain't got nothing on his angel pipes. No matter how damaged you feel, the Bible says 
You are God's masterpiece, his poema, from which we get our word poem. And God sings over you, his poetry in motion, turning the minor notes of your tragedy into a symphony. So know this, life is like a piano. The white keys represent joy. Black shows sadness. As you go through life, remember, black keys make music too. I thought that was actually a very interesting analogy that, that even in your saddest moments that God is rejoicing in song over you. All right, that's it for our program today, Bobby. Thanks again for being a part of our program. Hope to have you back again here in New Orleans. Be sure to look him up online for one of his sermons. You will not be disappointed. So until next week, God be with you. And this is it for news.